Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. All right, my friends, welcome back to the BJJ Break Podcast. This is episode 55. We've got an interview with AJ Azaram. Gary, what's up, man? Yeah. Hey, doing good. How about you, Byron? Ready for episode 55? Yes, I am. I'm excited to, to bring you this, guys this interview. Um, a lot of great advice from AJ, uh, whether you're a competitor or not. He, he really has a really interesting outlook on, on jiu-jitsu and, and, and performing you know, at, a comp- at a high competition level. Uh, a lot of good stuff in this one, guys. So that's a lot of fun. If you uh, want to get the BJJ Break podcast sent to your email every week, uh, there's a form online or on the BJJBrick.com or on our Facebook page. We can just enter in your email address and we'll send it out to you once a week. Make it easy for you. That way you'll never <laughs> miss an episode. You'll always be reminded. Absolutely. How's your week going, Gary? My week is always going good. Uh, can't complain. How about yours? Uh, mine's good. We had the the time change, which uh, meant we got to sleep in an hour, right? You know, I kind of messed up here. I I knew the time change, and I was planning on sleeping in, but I didn't realize my clock automatically switched <laughs> in the new time. So I slept for another hour, which was actually kind of nice. There you go. No no harm yeah. done. That's why they no do it on, from a no Saturday to no Sunday. Fall. Yeah. Well, I I got to remind everybody that um, during the time change is when they recommend to change their smoke detector uh, batteries in your house. So do at least check those, if not change them. And uh, they do work. I mean, that's, that's an amazing thing. I've never been, uh, like we said before, I'm a firefighter. I, I've never been to, uh, to a, a, a serious house fire, and uh, the able-bodied people were not able to get out of the fire if, um, if it was like at night, if they had a working smoke detector. It, they do save lives. It, it's a big deal. What about your uh, uh, carbon monoxide detector? Is yeah, it a good time yeah, to check that? Absolutely. Yeah, Especially like with the uh, weather changing and people probably turning on their furnace or their heater for the first time. Gary, you're on it, man. I love it. Hey, thanks. If I've been don't... hanging out with a firefighter for Byron for uh, 12, 13 years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, but... you actually haven't been a firefighter for 13 years. No. But... no. Oh, well. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's another big one there. So cool. Yep, check that out, guys. It's 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 worth mentioning on a non uh, an unrelated topic though. But ha- here's how you do it: you wait until most people are not expecting it. You go up there and you push the button. Uh, it kind of annoys everybody in the house. And uh, hopefully, if you have some kids, they know what it is that's going off. If not, it's a good way to tell them tell them what's up. I so do they it. Know what's up. And if you hear a bunch of uh, uh, beeps, normally that means you're. Uh, Need a new battery anyhow. Yeah, I've, if it's chirping. I actually had a buddy of mine ask me about that a while ago. He didn't know what it was. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they they'll kind of chirp like every minute or two. They go chirp, and that means the battery's almost dead. You're way past the time of, of changing batteries on that deal. You should that, – that basically tells you that you haven't changed it for years. Like, So it's time to change. Absolutely. Don't wait for that long because that's, that's, that's past the time because um, you want the thing to work. And it's it's – for the price of a battery, it could easily save everyone's life that's in your house. I mean, it's a, it's a small price to pay, and it's an amazing, amazing thing. I usually, if we're in a house on a medical call, and uh, and and, and it's kind of like not a big deal anymore. The the big problem's been resolved. I'll usually find the smoke detector and push the button, and see if it works or not. And it's kind of just jolts everybody. It's kind of funny. Have you ever scared anybody and Absolutely. Like, put them into a cardiac arrest? <laughs> no, but but oftentimes I get weird looks. As I'm I'm just you know look uh, a I'm having fun. It's kind of fun to watch them react and b it's, I'm, I'm looking out it's for good them. To, yeah, it's good to let them know if they if they do need it need it changed or whatever too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, let's get on with our uh, quote of the week. Um, like I said, check the smoke detector. Do it right now if you're on headphones. It's real easy. Um, here's the quote of the week. It's from uh, Budo Jake. Um, we talk a little bit before the quote, uh, and then he, he gets to his quote. We'll we'll talk about it after we roll that. So here it goes. For beginners, um, 
it's it's easy to get wrapped up and it's easy to get your life taken over with jiu-jitsu and, and to watch um, YouTube videos and to talk to people about it and everything. And all that's good. But the most important thing is to be training regularly. And I think twice a week is the minimum to really improve uh, at jiu-jitsu. So if you going three times a week, that's great. Four, five, that's amazing. But um, what kind of bugs me is these guys that are so intellectual about it they they train once a week or maybe less than that, and they just talk about it all the time. And talking about it's fine, but develop the muscle memory, the body mechanics. That's only going to happen through regular training in the academy. And by all means, use uh, Blue Video's apps uh, to supplement your training uh, to make it even better. But uh, there's nothing that's going to take the place of hard training on the mats. That was Budo Jake. Uh, nothing takes the place of hard training on the mats. And that is so true. Um, you can train all you want or, I mean, watch videos all you want, but you've got to get out there on the mat. You've got to train hard. Uh, like you said, you know, hopefully you can get there twice a week minimum, you know, three times, four times is even better. But you've got to put that time in on the mat, train hard with your partners. Yeah, that, I mean, if you're, it's different if you were hurt or something like that or if you're sick. T- take some time to get well. Look on, you know – Go out there and stay active in learning in the learning process. But like you said, nothing is going to take the place of hard training on the mat. That's that's how you get better at jiu-jitsu. You, you could you could go to a seminar and watch techniques and try to and, and try to figure them out, or you could go to class and, and skip out on the rolling. But you're really not going to get that much better. It's going to be a very slow progress for you. You got you got to get out there and, and roll. Yeah, I've seen people who really don't even drill or or study that much they just get out there and roll and uh seems like those guys get faster quick but then they get caught or get better faster but then they get caught uh where they need to start drilling so uh you know you got to get to the academy you've got to drill you've got to you know you've got to roll hard on the match you, you've got to do all of it slow roll hard roll drill a technique and uh that's the way you're going to get better yeah there's you got to find that balance what's right for you um between. Yeah, because everybody can't train, you know, seven days a week, twice a day. People have ob- other obligations. Uh, but, you know, hopefully, you know, as Budo Jake says, you can find two days a week to train. Uh, two days a week, you're saying at the minimum, you know, more the better. You know, some weeks you may not be able to make it twice a week, and, and that's that's fine. Just just keep going. Just find any time you got free time and, and get to the academy and uh, have some fun. Yeah, and that's the another main thing is to have a, is enjoy the journey of jiu jitsu. Uh, otherwise, you're not gonna you're not gonna stick around. It's 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 a tough sport. It's a tough martial art. Uh, if you're able to have fun with it, you're gonna enjoy it for the long haul, and you'll and you'll benefit your life. You know the, the benefits that it provides of, of fitness and 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 friendships that you gain and, and many other things. So enjoy the ride, guys. That music rolling in tells us it is time for the article of the week. Very excited. Oh, always excited for the article of the week. <laughs> uh, what do we got this week there, Byron? Yeah, it's uh, OK Kimono's uh, blog.com put out this article. It's called Five Important Things Your Instructor Wants You to Stop Doing. So definitely, if you want your instructor to like you, these are five important things not to do. Uh, the first one right off the bat, he mentions uh, don't be a YouTube warrior. We kind of mentioned that already. Um, it... it, it uh, it's okay, it's okay in most schools. Like some schools have rules against YouTube, but to to learn from some things on YouTube, but to come in every day with a different thing on YouTube that some the newest trend that's sometimes annoying for instructors to have to deal with that. Yeah, and I like what he what he says there. He goes back to that quote we've used before with Bruce Lee: "If you're not the man who has trained a thousand kicks, but the the man who has trained one kick a thousand times." So, uh, uh, I, I really like that quote. Yeah, that one kick that you trained a thousand times that will be your BJJ brick. That one choke or that armbar or sweep or whatever it is that will be there for you anytime you need it. That you're able to get in that position. That is your brick. You can smash with it. <clears throat> Number two there, um, forgetting to clean your gi. And I think everybody's heard this one. Uh, nobody wants to roll with a guy with a stinky gi. Nobody wants to get ringworm from that person. So please uh, stop coming to class if you don't have a clean gi. Yeah, and it if you're going to train more than – if you're training two nights in a row, you, you I think you need at least two gis. It's hard to train 
you know, depending on what your climate is like and things like that, but you, you got to get home and wash your ghee, hang your ghee out to dry, put a fan on it, it'll dry quicker. But still, if you're going to leave for work in the morning and throw your ghee in your gym bag, it's going to sit in your, it's going to be still damp in the morning. Like you need a, a different ghee to grab. Um, and that we could put some rotation in there and you'll always have a clean ghee hanging up, ready to go, uh, in the morning when you're, when you're leaving for, uh, for work or, or when you're getting ready to head out for just so you, you've got to have a clean ghee. You, there's no excuse to not have a clean ghee. Yeah, there's no excuse. And like Byron said, you know, have a rotation. As soon as you come home from the academy, put it in the washer, you know, hang dry it, put a fan on it and be ready and, uh, you'll be ready for next class. So definitely have a couple of geese if you're going to train, you know. You no know, four or five days a week. Yep. Uh, next on the list here, talking while training. Um, that I think everybody does it to some extent. Um, what while you're rolling is to, is to, it depends on who you're rolling with. You know, every you know usually friends. Some have been friends for a long time. We're going to talk, but there's a difference between like talking and then like stopping rolling and talking and, and using it to take a break. Like, yeah. and everybody has everybody's rolled with that guy, the guy who just uh, keeps talking. Uh, doesn't really want to train. I think, you know, just wants to talk. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't get to train every day. So when I do get to train, I, I want to put in my time. I want to come home tired. I want to, you know, roll every round possible. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, when you're on the mat, spend your time training. It's okay to talk as long as you're, you're training. I, I'm one of those guys I will talk, but I'm talking while I'm training. Yeah, it, I, I do. Uh, I agree. It's, it's good to keep it. At, you know, depending on who's with, keep it kind of lighthearted. If if there's a if there's a close skill level, it's going to be more of a of a of a battle. Maybe less talking is okay. But if it's a if it's a, a white belt rolling with the pro belt, the pro belt should talk a little bit. Maybe help him out. You know, not tell him exactly what to do. But if he's putting his hand in a bad spot, say, "Hey, move your hand here," and, and then just keep going. You know, like don't like let him totally get an advantage from that. But you know, just keep pushing the, the person and show that you're on the same team. And, and like, if you want to do what I do, when Gary's got like a deep choke in there, totally bring up something like, "Hey, who are you going to vote for this year, Gary?" As I'm getting choked, <laughs> and uh, hopefully he'll uh, get distracted and, and conversate about politics while I weasel out of the choke. <laughs> politics? What's that? <laughs> you know, I can actually, uh, you know, I got a little story related to this, but I was rolling not too long ago, and um, there's a guy who always shows up about 15 minutes late, a real fun guy to roll with. And so I'm training and I have my head away from the area where everybody walks in. So the guy was, I was on the bottom, guy was on top and, you know, yells, hey, you know, the guy's name. And, and I'm on the bottom and I kind of look back to see if he was there. And while I did, the guy sunk a choke, you know, <laughs> the, as I moved my head back, I opened my chin up and that was his way of submitting me. Was he even <laughs> he there? laughed afterwards. So uh, I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Yeah, nicely. So don't fall for the guy talking while training. He was trying to expose your, expose your neck. Yeah, uh, there's all kinds of distractions that, on the mat. <laughs> yep. Uh, number four, um, asking about promotions, and uh, you know this is a, a big no-no. And uh, I hear a lot of uh, instructors, you know, talk about it, and and I think that might be up there number one with the instructors but you know your instructor knows when you're ready he'll give it to you when he feels that you deserve it um, so definitely uh, come into class and, and put your time in and be a good student you know good to the academy to your training partners and it'll come and and the great thing is it's all about the journey it's not how quick you get the promotion as byron said earlier it's a fun ride you're going to have a great time you're going to learn a lot and uh, when you get that promotion, it is going to be so so rewarding. You're, you're going to remember it forever. Yeah, it's there's a few things about asking for a promotion. Uh, the the first thing that comes to mind is that you're almost like kind of telling your instructor how to do their job. Like, hey, don't forget, I'm about ready. Like, the, like n- let them do their job. Their job is to tell you when it's time to get promoted. Don't tell them how to do their job. How would you like it? I mean, if you're a doctor and the and the patients in there telling you, well, I read online. This is the the way you should do it. Well, I went to school for a bunch of years, and and I'm gonna do it this, <laughs> like this is the way that, that is actually the, the way we do it. So, um, that's one of the things that that, that comes to mind by asking. Uh, another one is it's like an instructor may not like value your your reasons for wanting the belt. Like like it's no instructor wants you to like like 
feel like that's like a last achievement that you're going to accomplish in jiu-jitsu. Like, once I get this belt, yes, you know, I'm there. Like, they just want that to be a step. Like, it shouldn't be, like, the ultimate goal that you're working towards at anything. Like... Yeah, it's just a, it's just another step on your journey. You're, uh, you, you've shown some skill. You, you're now at that level, um, but you still got a long ways to go from there. Yeah, the, the last one on his list of the the five important things your instructor does not does, wants you to stop doing is leaving early. Uh, I think that goes to it's kind of like our uh, the quote. You know, you've got to get on the mat. And you've got to train hard. Yeah, definitely. And and there are going to be times where you have to leave early. You know, maybe your your kid has a uh, uh, something going on at school or a basketball game that you have to go to. And and in that point, I think it's better that, you know, at least you even showed up or you may be injured and can really uh, most most uh, classes you start out, you know, with the drilling and the technique part. And you may be able to do that, but you, you, you may not be able to to, you know, get into you know full rolling at the end of yeah. class and and you know that might be a time to well, i don't know leave early because you might still want to stick around and watch because you're going to learn a ton if you do have the time from watching i think i mean this one boils down to to avoiding the rolling portion of the mat i think yeah. the instructor knows okay you know if you're nervous in something or you're kind of hurt or or whatever the instructor they quickly figure out if you enjoy rolling if yeah. you enjoy rolling and you're over there sitting on the sidelines, they know you'd rather be out there on the mat. You don't have to be like a tough, you know, tough guy or gal out there. Like, yeah, I got a broken rib, but I'm going to train today because I I got to show them that I'm not not a wimp. Okay, you got to heal. You got to get better. Your instructor knows that you're missing that you would rather be on the mat. That's not that's not the like that's not the leaving early that we're talking about. We're talking about the person who does not like the the aspect of of actually rolling. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And. uh there's always making, as he says, you know, I have this injury, I have a day, you know, always leaving early. And uh, for me, I, I tell you, the one thing I want to do is roll. But, but you know, it goes both ways. Yeah, it does. How many times have you seen the uh, guys who show up late and just show up to roll? And uh, while the rest, of, while everybody else is all tired from doing the, the cardio and the technique and everything else, uh, you're getting a fresh guy. So uh, it kind of, I guess we could say leave early and maybe uh, <laughs> if you have to. don't show up late. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I and I also, not everybody could roll all the time. Like, yeah. you know, several times we're, we're, Gary and I are training and, and there's, you know, somebody there who has been coming, you know, for years and years and is buddies with everybody and they're not, they haven't been rolling for a while. That's so, they're there for to, to train a little bit, to learn a little bit. To hang out, to have have a good time, and they're unable to to get on the mat and, and to like to really go at it, and they're they're that's it, it depends on your own personal goals, I guess. I mean, that's not yeah. nobody looks down on that person because that's not you know if 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 rolling isn't your thing, you can still I guess train you to. It's just gonna be a hard learning curve to get better and to gauge yourself. I guess would be a way to say that. Yeah, definitely. That's how you gauge yourself, and and you do get better quicker that way. But um, definitely check out that article. Um, uh, five important things your jiu-jitsu, your instructor wants you to stop doing, and it's uh, from OK Kimonos. So, uh, great article. And uh, if you also go on that uh, that website there, there's a there's a lot of great articles there. So check them all out, um, and I think you'll learn some stuff. Yep, and that that article was written by Christopher Reed. So, uh, hey Gary, let's get on hey, with our uh, hey, what do we got? Our big interview, man. Uh oh, time for the big interview. <laughs> All right, my friends, I'd like to welcome A.J. Agazarm to the BJJ Brick Podcast. A.J., how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you, brother? I'm doing great. It's an honor to have you on the show. You're always fun to to watch and, 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 and root for you as you compete. You're always uh, highly entertaining and, and very uh, fierce competitor out there, so you're always a blast. I appreciate that. It's kind of what I strive for. Well, good. I if, think jiu-jitsu is, is important to continue the progress of 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 it growing and um, the only way that's going to happen is if we fight with, you know, no, no holding nothing back. Cool. That's uh, I like that. The idea, like uh, going out there and, and not holding anything back and, and, and also you, you know, are known for putting on a good show. If somebody doesn't know who you are yet, could you describe a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is AJ Agazarm. I started jiu-jitsu in, in Clearwater, Florida, under Eduardo de Lima. I earned all my belts from him and uh, Master Carlos Gracie. Now I, I, I'm i based ma- mainly out of California, and, and I split time between Florida, and, and I'm back and forth in New York a lot, 
training and competing, traveling all over, um, staying within the um, IBJJF circuit as well, doing super fights for other organizations and and competing um, as much as I can pretty heavily. At the black belt, I know I have already. I, I got my black belt in 2013. I have over, you know, 75 matches already. Um, and more than, I, I think more than half of them are over in, in the absolute division. I'm a lightweight black belt. Um, yeah, so jiu-jitsu is, is really pretty much became my life the last couple of years. Do you always sign up for the absolute division? As much as I can is because it, we have a very large team, Gracie Baja. So one of the things that, that you know, is in the average Jeff, there's only two athletes allowed from each division. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it becomes a matter of seniority and, and who, who who we think as a team will be a better fit for it. But, yeah, absolutely. I try to, I try to compete the absolute as much as possible. Cool. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are off the mat? You know, off the mat, and, and this is something that's kind of always been, um, you know, what I've known, been known for is that, you know, I'm one, one person off the mat. When I go to a tournament, I'm very straight-faced and, you know, with a with a, a mission at at task, and you know, always you know very serious in what I'm doing there. And then often that I'm a, you know happy go lucky, you know, fun adventurous guy. I have my my license in skydiving, so I I, I go skydiving pretty regularly. Um, I like all extreme sports. Uh, you know, I wakeboard as much as I can when I'm in Florida. Um, I snowboard when it's snowboarding season. So yeah, it's, uh, I, and I love traveling. I think one of the things that jiu-jitsu has really given me is the ability to travel within, you know, all over the world. And that's something that I'm, you know, in my age, I'm trying to take advantage of as much as I possibly can. Um, I'm going to Australia at the end of the year, and I'm really excited for that. It's going to be the first time that I'm going to be there. Then I have a super fight that's going to be in um, England uh, the second week of January for an organization called Polaris. It's a really cool fight card. Uh, and then also, you know, after that, I, I have the, the European Championships, and I'll be doing some seminars around Europe. You know, so that's really something that I, I enjoy the most is, is the travel and seeing the different cultures, seeing the different countries, and um, I think it's it's really cool. Wow, you're a busy guy, especially with all that traveling. Um, what, what got you into the skydiving? That sounds like it's a Everyone always thinks it'd be it'd be cool to skydive, but like you actually have a license in skydiving, so you didn't just do it one time and then you. I did skydiving. You did it. You've done it a bunch, and you. You're yeah. Proficient at it. Well, actually, well, one of my friends had it was my birthday, and they, they had got me a a skydiving jump, like a tandem jump for my birthday, and you know, for me, I was always a you know kind of one of those persons that really seek that kind of thrill, and um, I did it, but actually. I, I forgot to say that I was in Brazil at Pedalagavia, yeah. and there was um, I was climbing the top of Pedalagavia, and there were uh, when we got to the top there were a bunch of base jumpers that were there using their windsuits and jumping off the Pedalagavia, <laughs> and 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 you know inevitably I, I you know flying all the way down to to the beach area, um, so that was my first time actually really seeing something like that. You know I had seen it online, uh, but in person was my first time, and I just thought it was was so insanely cool that it was something that I wanted to, you know, eventually be able to do. Um, and it, ironically, when I got down to Pedalagavia, I went to a place to go eat acai, um, and the whole team from the Red Bull that was up there at the top of the Pedalagavia was, was down at the, the acai place as well. So we, you know, I had some talking with them, and um, so that was really cool. And then I went back to Florida, one of my other black belts at my school, he's, a, he's about the same age as me, and we're just like, hey, let's go get our skydive license. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, with Florida, it's very difficult because it's raining all the time. So yeah. it, it's not like I could spend, you know, one day and then get my license. It's uh, over the course of months, I had to, you know, go in and get my, you know, do my, um, my task that I need to complete. I had to, you know, so many people think that oh, you just take a first you have to take like a six hour course then you take a six hour course then you have to complete a certain amount of jumps within that within a time uh, so it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of a lot of things that I have to do yeah I don't know what would be uh, scarier for me like 
you know, okay, a skydiving. So I got some, you know, I'm going to jump out of a, of a perfectly good plane and, and do that. That sounds, that sounds pretty exciting and fun. And then, um, yeah. to like the first time, imagine like, imagine AJ strapped to your back <laughs> behind <laughs> you, you know, hooks in, uh, and then, then to jump out of the plane on that, like that, that's like, uh, <laughs> the worst world to be in. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like I said, jiu-jitsu has given me the you know the, the the gift of travel, and and, cool. and that's one of the other reasons why I chose skydiving because I can, you know, there are drop zones all over the world where oh, I yeah. can go and I can really experience that country. I think in a whole other way that most people cannot, and and that's what the license offers me is that ability to go um, from drop zone to drop zone, and I just show my 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 list of jumps and I'm that's sure cool. that I'm certified and. It's a heck of a. Most people won't realize that skydiving for licensed skydivers is a heck of a lot, a heck of a lot cheaper than it is for somebody who doesn't have a license. Ah, that that makes sense. Uh, are yeah. you? Um, some people aren't really bothered by heights. Are you a little bit afraid of heights, or they didn't bother you, or does it terrify and makes it more fun that way, or what is it for you? You know, I, I think it's kind of indifferent. But there, w- there was one thing that I did experience when I first got my license that I was kind of, you know, really excited about. The first time that I ever was doing my uh, when I was my, the first time I went tandem with somebody attached to me, I I didn't feel you know I just okay this is going to be like a roller coaster ride no yeah. no emotions. But when I had my my when I was cleared for solo status and I was going to to complete my first solo skydive on my own, I felt the feelings that I used to have when I used to competing for the very first time that you know that the clammy palms the, the anxiousness the you know so that was a that was a feeling that i haven't had for a very long time and that i was experiencing with skydiving so that was that was pretty cool that is cool you get the the rush of something new and and uh exhilarating like that yeah yeah this don't back. get me wrong i still get the rush of the yeah. exhilaration from competing <laughs> But it's, now it's something new. Yeah, like you said, seventy-five matches as black belt in in a couple of years. You're competing a lot. Yeah, like yeah, less than two years. I, I got my my black belt in 2013, uh, July. Um, yeah, so and I was talking with one a couple other the guys from another school, and <laughs> the only reason why I know that number is I recently did an article with BJJ Heroes. Yeah, had to list all of my my matches at Blackbone and I was even surprised I'm like wow you already have this many <laughs> this many matches that's it yeah that's an impressive number and, and, and then if you look at the list of the guys that are on there that's also that's cool man could you describe your yeah, style your style of jiu-jitsu for somebody who hasn't seen you compete yet I'd say my, my style of jiu-jitsu um, is, is I, I hold nothing back you know I and, and I think that's, you know, kind of says the most of why I, I compete in the absolute. I, I really believe in jiu-jitsu. I, I come from a wrestling background. Um, but, you know, I, over the time I've learned that wrestling does not beat jiu-jitsu. Um, and that's why I was really, you know, excited about learning the, the, the martial art of jiu-jitsu. Um, and that's kind of helped mold it and shaped my, my personality on the mat when I'm competing. Um, I'm not afraid to be put in a submission. Um, it's actually exciting for me to find ways to get out of submissions. And um, I, I'm I'm not afraid to compete. I'm definitely not afraid to compete that somebody, uh, you know, you know, twice or three times my size. Um, I, because I believe in jiu-jitsu. I believe in what it offers. And I, um, and I think once people really can comprehend and understand the concepts, um, you really start to have a lot of fun with it. I, you know, I... I, I I see a lot of people, especially in the IBJJF, that they're really, they're really just concentrated and focused on winning, and and that's not really my motive. My motive when I'm out there is to just go out and have fun and explore jujitsu and for the way it was intended, and um, you know, it, you know, just concentrating on winning can really, you know, freeze up your game. It can. It can make you just like a point or advantage fighter, and, yeah. and, and and very boring to watch. And and I encourage others as they're going out and they're starting to compete and, and to uh, um, you know take on this sport is 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 go at it with with no no reservations. Go at it with with nothing to lose, and and that's where you really find the fun. And you find the fun in competing. You find the fun in weight cutting. You find the fun in all the facets that are involved with with jujitsu and um, and competitions. So. That's cool. I, I like, of course, your style of, of of like always bringing it, not holding anything back, and and not, you know, not coasting on a on a lead. 
is going to be a lot of fun to watch and 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 it makes for great beautiful jiu-jitsu do you think it's ever cost you like a match that you could think of like if i were to slow things down if i would have if i would have waited a little bit longer and, and just and i had the i had i was up do you think it's ever cost you like a match that, that you could have won you know if, if i'm with a nine point lead there's never been a time where i've lost a match because i was submitted or where i ended up giving up 12 on interest points in the last time you know where, where i do find it is that okay you know for example i just I was competing in the Pan Am finals of Nogi. It was the finals of the absolute. Um, I had made it all the way to the finals with Jackson Souza. And we had a very close match the first six minutes. Um, it was 0 0. I think the seventh or, you know, eighth minute, he ended up getting two points for a takedown. Um, you know, in the last minute of the fight, I was down two, two to zero and I was still continuing to go at it, go at it, go at it. I could have accepted a loss of two to zero. Yeah. Or I could have walked off the mat and knew in my head that I did everything I possibly can. And that's what I did. I went after Jackson as much as I could. And, you know, he inevitably caught me in a, an arm bar with the last like, 13 seconds in the match. Um, but, you know, it's like you can't help but walk off the mat feeling good about yourself and feeling good about, you know, knowing that you literally gave everything you had. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not, it, there's a, there's a, a very fine line between reckless yeah. and tenacious. Yeah. That's, that's a, a uh, interesting way to say that. Yeah. Um, that well put, man. That's, that's cool. Could you describe your training schedule and who you train with? Yeah. So uh, the, in the beginning of, of my jujitsu years, I, I was every day, two times, a, two times a day, um, with Eduardo de Lima down in Clearwater, Florida. And then I moved over to, to, to get my undergrad at Ohio State to finish my education in there. Um, so that kind of put a pause in my, my training with Eduardo. After I graduated, I went back down to Eduardo and, um, you know, trained part of my first year at Brown Belt with him. Um, then I went out to California and I started training with all the guys from Gracie Baja there. Um, it was in California that I really started to amp up my traveling schedule. Um, but you know, the guys that I train out with in California, Homolo Bahal, um, Tyron Gracie, you know, Octavia Souza, all the, all the, the main GD guys, Budo Jake. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a uh, a long list of, of, of great guys. When I travel, I, I think that's where I really find a lot of fun. When I go to New York, I'm, I'm in New York, I'm training at Henzo Gracie's Academy with, with Igor Gracie, Gregor Gracie, um, you know, John Donahair is a, you know, one of the, you know, the best coaches and, and not, you know, not just competition jujitsu, but even for the MMA guys. Um, so I, I really find a lot of, uh, a lot of happiness in, in traveling and, and training. Um, when I'm down in Florida, of course, I'm back down with Eduardo. When I'm in the UK, um, you know, there's, there's Braulio there, there's Victor Schema, there's Hodger Gracie. Um, in Brazil, one of my good friends, um, Diogo Almeida, we call him Tatuba, he has a school um, in, 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 in Rio, uh, as well as there's the Gracie Baja headquarters in Rio. Um, so it's, it's, it's really exciting. That's, that's uh, not just a, a great list of training partners, but like places you go to, everywhere you go, you've, got, you've already got places already lined out and, and the guys that you're going to train with are already ready to go. That's, yeah, and that's 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 something that jujitsu has given me that I'm, I'm really you know I'm fortunate to have, and I, I I encourage others out there as they're starting to to train and they're starting to compete is 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 look around you and see there are a lot of people out there that are doing the similar thing, and you can create these bonds and create these relationships, and you can literally have it you know jujitsu is worldwide, um, and I know a lot of people that I talk to even. You know, whether it be girls or, you know, even anybody, everybody in their, their life says, no, no one says, man, I, I really I regret traveling. I regret going and exploring this part <laughs> yeah. of the world. Everybody wants to travel. Jiu-Jitsu is the vessel in which it, it, it offers me to be able to do that. And, um, yeah, and, 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 and I'm fortunate to meet a lot of cool people. I met Jackson Souza last time I was in Brazil. He took me around and showed me through the favela and through the contagellos. The, it, was, it was, you know a life altering experience. And he's a guy from a different team, you know, yeah. he's that. And you like you said you've competed against him. Yeah. And I competed against him. 
Cool. Um, what are your, your goals you have for yourself right now? My goals are, are to, you know, when I first started to jiu- when I first started jiu jitsu was to win the world championships, both in the gi and the no gi. Um, you know, I, I just had came, um, I've been fortunate to accomplish that. Um, first half of my goal was to medal gold in everything. Um, no gi. I, I won a gold medal at the European Championships. I won a gold medal at the Pan American Championships. The Brazilian Nationals, I'm the first ever American to win the Brazilian Nationals, no gi. And then also this last year, I just won the World Championships, no gi. Um, I also have goals to, to win the absolute for, for, the, for all of the no gi tournaments. Um, I, I do have the European Championships absolute gold. I also do have the, um, the American Nationals um, so left for me is to is to win the Pan Americans. I, I I took second this year. Um, the year before I took third. Brazilian Nationals I took second in the absolute. Um, in the world I I have to you know I have goals to win the absolute as well. And then to do the same thing again in the gi. Um, so it's uh, there's 20 medals out there, gold medals <laughs> to be had, and and I'm only you know a little little less than halfway done. Wow, it's a it's big goal, but you've got your, um, you're heading in the right direction, and you're you're well on your way to to getting there. Sounds like anyway. And yeah, you know, I uh, you know, like I like I said, I, I was very fortunate to start with Eduardo de Lima and, and and with the training partners that I have. You know, I, I find that you know, birds of a feather flock together. By surrounding myself with like-minded people, that you know, it's 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 really helping me you know, grow and mature as an athlete and also as a, as a jiu-jitsu competitor. Cool. Could you think of something that you've learned as a, since you have your black belt belt that, that you didn't really understand before? You know, one thing that, you know, just because I, I was involved with wrestling and teaching wrestling prior to jiu-jitsu, um, you know, it, it was kind of just reiterated for me. Yeah. Being a black belt, you know, is, is important to know how to do things for yourself, but also you have, you, you inherit a responsibility to be able to teach those, teach it and pass it on for others. Um, you know, being a black belt has, has taught me how to explain and how to be able to, to, to pass things on to other people. If you can't explain a, a position really well, you don't really understand it. Like if it, you can't simplify a position then that means you don't understand it. So as a black belt, you, you're, you're constantly yearning to, simplified position so that you can make it understanding for somebody who has no knowledge whatsoever of jiu-jitsu. And I think that's part of the responsibility that, you know, falls back on you as a black belt. You know, take somebody off the street. Can you as a black belt walk through all of the basics, all of the fundamentals of self-defense into what the difference is between jiu-jitsu self-defense and sport jiu-jitsu? I think these, these things, you know, are really important for the growth and, um, you know, that's kind of things that I strive for as a, as I'm you know, continuing down the road. That's cool. And it, it's important to be able to explain, like you said, if you understand something very well, it should be easy to explain for you. Um, if, if it's, if it's still like kind of confusing to you, then it's, it's, you kind of, it's, it's harder for you to teach. It's harder. It comes out as, with more jargon and more confusion for your student. Right. What do you do? Yeah. What do you do before you uh, compete? Like a warm up or or any any sort of thing that you're getting ready to step on the mat. Yeah, so for me, I, I have my rituals that I do before I compete. You know, it's a lot of it includes, um, you know, the the background I had in wrestling. I would I would always make sure that I I get a very good sweat before I went in those thirty four five minutes out before my my actual start time of my match. As long as I could blow out my wind, my my lungs and and. Um, I feel a good sweat. I knew I was ready and, and prepared for, for not only just the one match, but for the tournament. Um, so it was very important for me to get a sweat. After I get a sweat, I just, I pop on um, my headphones and I literally just sit and wait until my, my division is called. Cool. It sounds like it's, it's been working good for you too. So get a good sweat going and then get your headphones on and, and, and be ready to work. Yeah, there are a lot of exercises that I like to do in order to to get the blood pumping and and to get going. Um, 
you know, it's, and, and those, that's what I stick by. And when, as soon as I, I complete those things, I, I'm, I'm sweating good. I'm, um, I'm feeling pretty, pretty good. And, um, I'm ready to go. And now it's just waiting for the remaining 15, 20 minutes before I actually step on the mat. And that's one of the things that, you know, that people, I think a lot of times they, they, they have this idea in their head of what a jujitsu match is. It's not a fight. It's not a, it's not, you're punching someone in the face. They're trying to rip your head off. It's the way I like to look at jujitsu is, is, is a match. It's a, it's a similar to whether you're going to pull off a chair, yeah, sit down and, and exchange pieces on a chessboard with someone in front of you. It's very similar to that on the mats of jujitsu. And once people realize that they don't need to psych themselves up and get so excited and pump, you know, get their blood pumping and get their adrenaline going. I mean, you know, this is the way that I do it. And this is, you know, where I feel very comfortable is I, 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 the music I listen to is this classical music is just to keep me alert and, and, and mellow. And, um, you know, I, I know the things that I need to do when I get on the mat, but with the mindset that I have that it's not a fight, it's not a, it, there's not somebody that's looking to actually beat me up. It, it's, it's, it's an exchange of moves. It's when, when you really understand that and when you really can, can comprehend that in your head, you, you become a much better competitor because of it. That's cool. And it's not like, I, I think of like the new person who's trying to get all psyched up for their first match, you know, of the day. Um, and, and really when they do that, don't forget that you got a second match, hopefully. And, and usually if you're like, you know, like you say, like, feel like you're in a fight and your adrenaline's pumping and, and, and everything's going 110 miles an hour and you do win, that second match is going to be tough. But yeah, a match should always be a, a, a constant progression. Um, whether it's a constant progression to the, 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 the final tick of the clock and the time allowed. Or whether it's a final progression until when you earn your your submission, um, you know it's never intended. I, uh, you know, to start at a million miles per hour and end at a million miles per hour, because like you said, in the tournament, you, you you have to duplicate that pace five times, and if you're doing the absolute, it's ten times. How has uh, training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu affected you off of the mat? Yeah, it's actually funny because I, I come from a wrestling background where a lot of it was 100 miles per hour. Yeah. 100% of the time. Um, and, and that's where I was very fortunate with Eduardo in being able to transform and mold my mindset into the jiu-jitsu. When I first started jiu-jitsu practice, I walked off the mat and I was like, that's it? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I come, I came from a college background of wrestling where it was very intense all the time. Um, the lifestyle of jiu-jitsu is very chill. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's something unique. And I, and I think it really helps my overall happiness into other areas of my life. Let's talk a little bit about that. The, the cultural differences of, of wrestling versus, uh, jujitsu. Um, like you said, it, wrestling is very intense and jujitsu is, is not that way. How, how does that affect the learning process and, and then, and also the competition? Yeah, so at first it was very difficult. At, at first it was, uh, I was over overcoming a, a robotic program's mentality. And jiu-jitsu, you have to be very open-minded. You have to be, you know, open to seeing the, the unlimited possibilities that jiu-jitsu has. And, and that helps in, in, in life in itself, meeting a bunch of other people of different cultures. You know, you have to be open-minded to see what they're all about, to see their, you know, how their society works. Um, so, you know, it's just that being molded by Eduardo to, to transform my mindset into being less pro- programmed into more open minded. Are, are the wrestling mats in the gym, uh, more like, does it feel like a competition every day you go in there and train or is it like, in jujitsu, like I have no problem telling a guy who uh, just escaped my submission, how to, how he, how he could. Or, or a guy just have to how to escape the submission. Is it is that same thing in, in wrestling? Like you're always helping out your your buddy, or is it more uh, competitive amongst the team? You know, especially at the college level, it's a very competitive environment and a very competitive atmosphere. Um, when there's techniques that are be given from from the coaches, yeah, they're they're definitely hands on with us, helping us improve certain certain techniques. 
Um, but it's in terms of similarities, there are very few. <laughs> <laughs> but does, has that helped you uh, with your mindset while you compete in jiu-jitsu? Like you have that wrestler's mentality? When you say wrestler's mentality, what do you mean? I mean, mean like just like mentally tough. Like, um, Yeah. I think wrestling definitely has given me that and, and you know, a number of uh, things that has transpired within my life have helped me with mental toughness. Um, but I also practice mental toughness. And I think that's very important for a, for a jiu-jitsu match is to be able to have mental toughness. Um, the ability to, to to take on any frustrations and, and handle it, you know, subtly, handle it, handle it level-minded without letting your emotions get involved. Um, and it, it, you know, it's funny you bring this up because I'm, I'm constantly, I'm, I'm expressing this to my, to my athletes that I, I coach for in wrestling is that wrestling, you know, I constantly say, don't let your emotions get involved. Don't let that propel you, um, in the, in the match. But at the same time, you have to be very, you know, t- tenacious and you have to be very passionate in your fight. So it's, it's a very, very thin line of not letting your emotions getting involved and then competing with passion. How, how would you said you practice mental toughness? Can you give us a some sort of an example or a little bit of help on yeah, that? Yeah. One? So one thing that I really like to do is is putting myself in bad situations, um, in in order to, to to work my my way through it. Um, you know, for an example, for physical conditioning, I will find a time that is very not conducive to wanting to be able to do a workout. So that would be at six o'clock in the morning when it's raining and I'm doing stadiums. Okay. Now add 35, <laughs> 40 pound weights in your hands and going up the stadiums about six o'clock in the morning and it's raining. Nobody wants to do that, but to be mentally tough, you have to be able to do that and to do that without letting your emotions get involved. Um, you know, I, I, those are, that's an exercise that really helps my mental tough. Another one would be, would, would be playing situations in my head over and over so that when they do happen, I'm a little bit more well-equipped that as I, I had kind of already walked myself um, through it before it had happened. And that's similar to, you know, it's kind of trust, trust strategies. Cool. I'll, I'll have to try to train in, in a little more uh, terrible conditions. <laughs> On the mats in jiu-jitsu, it's, you know, it's putting myself in, you know, finding a lower belt and yeah. not putting myself in an arm bar and, and figuring out ways to escape and you know one thing i learned over time is <laughs> tapping in the jiu-jitsu academy is um is is acceptable um but, you know there there's not a habit that you want to create of tapping because you know it, it's full of thin lines it's it's being accept you know accepting the fact that you have to tap in the academy but also you're, you know, being being uh, stubborn with submissions in, in competitions, so you have to practice it. Yeah, I've, you are uh, definitely stubborn when it comes to submissions. Uh, <laughs> have I mean, like you're tough as nails. I couldn't imagine trying to some of these guys with what's going on in their head as you just get out of one submission after the other, and, and you keep coming at them the same ferocity and tenacity, tenacity that you did before it started. Ever uh, get any uh, big injuries while competing? You know, I, I've been very fortunate to not have any any severe injuries. Um, you know, minor aches and pains, of course, but you know, never never anything that's been detrimenting to my progress or or allowing me to continue. Um, and 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 that just goes back to studying the position. Um, I, I, there are a lot of things with with escapes and with defend, defending of submissions that people don't realize, and, and they're they're not open-minded in terms of escapes. They think, okay, just because he has a knife on my throat means I'm dead. No, you know, there's ways for you to take, you know, to get out. And there's there's concepts and 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 very practical escapes that you, you have to be aware of. Um, but you're right; it's it's actually, you know, it's very demoralizing if you have a guy that you have a very tight submission on and they get out of it, and they're still coming at you. It's just like, <laughs> you, you know, you're. Yeah, you're very frustrated yeah. as, a, as an opponent, I'm sure. It's frustrating. And then what, what I think people don't realize when you have a close submission and the guy taps you know, nine times out of ten, you're more tired than you realize because the guy just tapped and it's over. But when he gets out yeah. of that, that small percentage chance of time, it's like, 
oh man, I'm, I'm tired, and, and and now he's really bringing it. So, yep, that's part of why your matches are so fun. Um, could you give some? <laughs> could you give some advice for a, a student who's got maybe a year or two that's going to do their first tournament? You know, a lot of times I I, I see see you know people in the jiu-jitsu academy, they've been training for a couple of years, and I said, well, you know, have you competed yet? And they said, no, and they, they come up with all these excuses on why they haven't competed, and and that's, you're always going to have until you actually just, you know, face your fear and you go and you do it. What's, it it's, it's, it's a comfort zone. It's a comfort zone. Stepping out of your comfort zone thing that you have to just, you know, you have to just do it, and and you have to go at it with, 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 an open mind and an idea in your head that the whole process in itself is going to be something that's going to be enjoyable all the way from cut and wait. If you have to, to, you know, the feelings you're going to get before the match and embracing the whole thing as a, as a whole, as a, instead of in parts, um, because then your, your mind starts to focus on those little parts. You know, I, I find my success when I am embrace the whole process of a tournament as a whole. The traveling, the competing, yeah. the flying, the the hotel, the the people I meet, the, 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 all, these are little parts that make up the whole thing. And, and and when you thoroughly, you know, have a passion and a love for what you do, it, it shows. And 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 that for me was always what helped me have good feelings when I compete. So the whole I, that's that's cool because in reality, half the people in the tournament lose their first match and they're done. So if you embrace that as that's your tournament was you know a few minutes of, of of grappling and now you're done, that's not very satisfactory a lot of times. But if you embrace it as the as the whole thing with the traveling and the and the more intense training and, and everything that goes into it, as as the entire that's competition. Yeah, that's a way. That was your I, I tournament. Love that. Yeah, that was your that was your that was your experience. Now you have a whole, you know, you have a. a those little experiences on the grand scheme of, of the, the experiences from your white belt to your black belt. You know, it's a, it, it's a giant curve with a lot of curves in between it. Cool. Um, I love that. For me, at least it is. Could you describe yourself as a blue belt? Blue belt was some of the most fun and exciting days of my life. And it was because I competed it. Literally. I, I, I mean, I, I kid you not, I competed probably every weekend, <laughs> Um, for, <laughs> for as, it was a very short belt for me. I was awarded my, my blue belt in three months. Um, and then, um, the following year I was promoted to purple belt. Um, but in that time I, I, I competed and, and I, and I took at it because there was something out there that I wasn't aware of and I wasn't familiar with. And I was gaining that experience. The more I went out there and the more I competed and I was, you know, I was meeting all these people and I, it was just so fun. You know, it was uh, it was an experience that, you know, has, has followed me and, and has built me up to the person I am today. Um, were you still using a lot of your wrestling, like uh, technique wise, or were you kind of switched over to more of a jujitsu style? I, no, absolutely. You know, was still programmed through wrestling because I was still wrestling in college at that time. So it wasn't until you know towards the end of my purple belt, brown belt years, right? I I kind of made the the, the the switch in my head, um, you know, it, it kind of just it hit me and it connected, and that's when I knew, and that's kind of like I felt my whole career kind of take off at that point. I think my whole brown belt year I pulled guard most of my my matches, <laughs> um, but the blue belt, you know, those were because it was the it was the, it was the you know the forefront. It was the laying of the you know laying of the foundation. It was. Their feelings that I was going to have that I was never going to experience again, and I knew that. And I was, yeah. I was, it was very fortunate to be around in, a, in, a, in an academy that was full of guys that were, you know, between their their mid thirties and mid forties, and they were always looking at me. They're like, "How old are you?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm 18 years old." They're like, "Oh, I'd give anything to be 18 again." And like, just do it while you can, do it while you have it, do it. Um, and and I think that, you know, that constant, those constant remarks and yeah. the constant motivation, motion, you know, from and the folks that I was surrounded with, it it really helps me kind of take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and just just run with it. Cool, and that goes to show like how much the the team, you, you know, getting advice from those guys on your team really helped and develop you as a as a as a competitor. At, at that age of any you know any young man, he's always in a in a very fork, uh, uh, you know, a fork in the in the road kind of moment for his life, and 
you know, I was very fortunate, like I said, to be surrounded by people that helped helped put me into that that direction. Let's say you've got uh, like a kid, like you know, in junior high, maybe high school, and he's he's loving jujitsu. Um, but wrestling season's coming up. Is it is it a good move? You think? To, to take off and, 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 and do the wrestling at, at school and, and take off a little jiu-jitsu or just keep training jiu-jitsu and, and don't even touch the wrestling? When, 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 I, when, I, when somebody has a wrestling background and they, they, find, the ability to, they find the ability to be able to, to, to um, fuse both of them together, yeah. they're, very, they're a very dangerous, very dangerous opponent. You know, not not even to mention if they have a, both of those, and then they go into MMA. So I, I I really encourage anybody who has the ability to wrestle in the high school and in college to do it because it helps it helps tremendously. Cool. Yeah, that's it, it's. I think it's a little hard maybe for some jiu-jitsu gyms to realize that that's like the right thing for their students to do is to go and to wrestle and, and to, to take a little time off of jiu-jitsu. But when they come back, it's it's amazing sometimes the differences that they bring back. Yeah, their their stand up's going to be great. Their 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 understanding of of takedowns, you know, takedowns and jujitsu are are very different, especially yeah. you know, in, in comparison. Um, but you know, it it helps to have that. Absolutely. Um, could you have any tips for a student who's trying to to kind of find their own game plan before they get ready to compete? One thing that really helped me was when I was a blue belt. Eduardo would put these positions and and he would make me, um, you know drill them to where I couldn't even drill them wrong anymore. You know, when you start to drill something when you first learn it, you, you do it wrong a couple of times yeah. before you get it right. And then once you get it right, you stop. Well, Eduardo would say, you know, drill them until you can't get them right, until you can't get them wrong anymore. Um, and, and you know, there were a lot of key positions that really helped me. Um, you know, sweeps from the guard. Um, I, had, I, had set, I had set sweeps that I was, you know, with variations that I was really focused on as well as a, a handful of passes that I had and, and then, you know, a, a handful of, of submissions that were really important to, to know. Um, so I would say that anybody that's trying to develop their game, don't focus on one area. Don't be a great passer and be a horrible on bottom. Don't be a horrible on bottom and be a great passer or, or someone that's really great on their feet. Try to embody all that jiu-jitsu has, top, bottom, and, uh, and standing up. And, and every day work towards developing all those aspects. Cool. That'll really help get the get, get people to help find their game. What would be a good goal for a, a first-year student? Um, a, a good goal for a first-year student yeah. would be is take jiu-jitsu classes as much as you possibly can. Um, you know, it's, uh, and... and and compete. Don't let don't let your excuses that you think you have in your head that are reasons to why you shouldn't compete be reasons to, that that let you um, that prevent you from competing. Just kind of just embrace the Nike philosophy. Just do it. Just go out there and experience it, and you'll you'll be you know you'll be with a lot more thoughts in your head than the ones you were had before it, and yeah. they'll be much better for you. Do you think that I mean you you competed a lot as a blue belt, but you had it just for a short amount of time? Is that one of the main reasons why you weren't a blue belt very, very long? Um, or did it help you? I was training. I was training twice a day, six days a week. Okay, so I think that was kind of one of the reasons. <laughs> a lot of mat time on there. Yeah. Now, if you're teaching a class and and there's it's primarily new students, what would be like a a trait of a student that you would kind of uh, appreciate in somebody you know one thing that as I teach it that, that always whether it be wrestling or jujitsu that always stands out to me is somebody that's in, you know attentively listening and then having questions intelligent questions around them um, you know I, I would always be training the a technique that Eduardo would show me and then I would would go at it you know with with um, every, all the angles that he showed and then I would have I raise kind of raise my hand, hey professor, can you help me with this? Am I doing this right, or this is this the way? Just kind of just confirming. Um, I don't know if that answers cool. your question, yeah, but it was yeah, kind of yeah. like just students that listen well and 
and, and being clearly attentive. And, and I would take notes when I was in classes with Eduardo. I had a notepad that I would write things down, and I would learn a position. And then at the end of the class, I would go write it down, and um, that really helped me a lot. Cool. Yeah, that's, Don't ever that's call exactly. out a black belt on the mat, though. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a good idea. That's 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 one that my professor helped me learn was don't, don't if you're an uh, you're an underbelt don't ever say hey to another black belt hey you want to roll <laughs> yeah you have well, a, is uh, there a story there for that or just the, some tough rolls what's that is there a story behind that or just some tough rolls that you you gotten afterwards no no just like um dojo etiquette kind of okay thing. Oh, I got you um so you compete. Uh, a lot or as much as you can in the absolute division I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, what would be like a good advice you, you would have somebody doing the absolute division for the first time do they need to change their like do you play a different game when you go in the absolute division or do you kind of try to do the same thing or or, or if, you, you, if you only train with guys that are on your same size in the academy and then you try to go do the absolute yeah. division you're, you're not going to have any success whatsoever yeah Okay, that's yeah. You got to train with the, with the guys, and then and probably I'm not a very big guy myself, but it probably goes for the bigger guys to train with the smaller guys as well. Like it's just, oh, it, yeah. it is different for them to if they only train with big guys. It's different when they get a hold of a smaller guy to control them and to deal with what they what they bring this. Absolutely, well. and they have to account for a lot less, a lot more space. Yeah, that is um, true. That would be if they had somebody that would that was much larger than them. Have, is there anybody out there that you would like to compete with that you haven't had a chance to yet? You know, at, at, when I was a purple belt, I competed against Bushesha, and he was a black belt. I think I'd like to have that match again. <laughs> That's awesome. I'd love to see you, see you and you two go at it. Yeah, Nogi, I would much rather yeah. um, compete with Kron. Okay, that'd be fun. Be fun one to watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other uh, grapplers that you like, kind of high level guys that you've gotten to skydive with you? Um, you know, actually, there's a group of my my buddies that are not really grapplers that that I um trying to get them to do jujitsu in the sky with me. So there will be a video <laughs> of that coming out soon for sure. Awesome. You got you got to get Budo Jake up there. Yeah, that would be really cool. Um, he's kind of over it. No, he, I, I think he did it once and did he? he'd never do it again. He's done, huh? That's funny. I do have a video of me drinking an acai drink in the sky. That was pretty cool. Yeah. How, how do how yeah, do you how do you drink that in the? I got to have like a. It's not in a cup, is it? It was a can of uh, uh, Samazon <laughs> acai that I had opened up <laughs> and then drank it and crushed it and put it in my pocket. That's funny. How much of it did you actually get down? A, a good amount. A lot of did it went you? all over me, but a good amount I was able to, was able to drink. <laughs> you get down to the back on Earth, and then it starts raining. I'll say you down on you. <laughs> I guess it hit far Those before you. People. Oh, that'd be funny. Uh, if somebody wants to get hold of you or just keep up with you and all your competitions, how could they follow you? Man, they, they can on Instagram and Facebook is at the Florida Boy, um, and you feel free to anytime can send me a, a, a direct message on Facebook. Um, I have a website. It's ajagazarm.com. Cool. But I think the best way is to... I, I don't think the, the website is actually finished yet, but it is um, definitely in the works. But the best way is Facebook and, and Instagram. Cool. I'll put links and to... Twitter. I'll put links Twitter, to those. I'm sorry. It's at Florida Boy. At, okay, cool. I'll get all those collected up and put them on the on the page there. And check out, check out my acai videos. And if anybody's making acai bowls of themselves, to tag me on Instagram and uh, share it with me, and I'll be... Be sure to check it out. Cool. Do you have any sponsors you'd like to mention? Yeah, definitely. Show Your Roll is, I, I, you know, I've been with them since I was a purple belt. You know, really, you know, was loving growing growing with them in the sport as they grew as a company. I was growing as an athlete. Budo videos, just phenomenal. A uh, group of guys, you know, Budo Dave, Budo Jake. And uh, they're, really, they're really awesome to be around in terms of the whole, you know, concept and, and, and lifestyle of jiu-jitsu. Um, yeah, and I also, I want to, a big thanks to um, Doc Kessler and the guys over at OC Fight Doc. They take care of me um, a great deal, you know, every time, you know, before competitions, post-intense workouts, they're they're taking care of me all the way up from stem, stem work and massage and 
physical therapy to all my, you know, bruises and aches and pains and making adjustments for my back, you know, chiropractic work. It's, it's, it's amazing. And it's what keeps me, it's what keeps me going, you know, every day and, and throughout the tournaments and, and my optimum level of, of um, performance, you know, keeping me in, in the best shape of my, in my life. So it's, it's, you know, people that I really owe a lot of, a lot of gratitude for and, you know, they're, they're a big sponsor for me is the guys over at OC Fight Docs, um, William Kessler. And then I have another company called Rev Local. Um, they deal with revolutionizing local search for local businesses. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be a part of them. Sam Bazan hooks me up with Acai, so I can, can never leave them out. Is the reason why I, I love Acai so much. So Awesome. All right, sounds good. It was a pleasure talking with you. Okay, brother. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, AJ. All right, we do uh, appreciate him giving us the time and a, a bunch of good information out there. Gary, he during the interview, he talked about enjoying the entire process of the tournament, not just the match. Like the the the, the diet coming up to it, the, the getting in a better physical condition, the experience of the travel if there's if it's required, the experience of of meeting people and, and to seeing your your teammates compete, all these other things. That is your tournament. So many times people get up there, they go, they do all that stuff. And they're on the mat, you know, one minute to five minutes, maybe ten, maybe they get the second match, and they're done. And it's and it's a it's a short time frame to experience a tournament in, you know, a few minutes. But that's not your tournament. Your tournament is the entire thing. Even the training, all the travel is something that you should take in and you should enjoy the the whole process of that's the tournament. Not not on the mat, off the mat, tournament over. That's just a small part of, of
city. We'll walk into shelter anytime soon. She's absolutely miserable. She needs to get back tonight. And the last person, let's say you're a single guy, is uh, is, a, is a lovely young lady. Um, you you see her and you talk to her just for a few seconds, and you know she's like the one. Like th- th- this is this could be the love of your life. And if you don't don't take her into town now, opportunity gone. Sorry, Gary. Uh, you'll never you'll never find her again. So you have room for one person in your car uh, next to you there. What do you do? You know, first of all, I'd feel bad passing you up. Oh, uh, man. He's already figured, passed me up. I figured you can do your uh, – you could figure it out yourself. You're a pretty bright <laughs> individual. Um, the hot chick, that would be tough to pass up. You know, like you said, it's the uh, – uh, the one potential love of your life, man. Yeah, but you know, I can never live with myself with the old lady who has medical issues. If she happened to uh, pass away or anything, I, I'm sorry, I'd have to take her because I could never live with myself if something did happen. Yeah, Gary, that's the same exact response I had, man. Sweet. So we were both. Uh, we, we, how we, could that be wrong? How could that be wrong? Well, a you're leaving your buddy Byron here out in the rain. B, you're leaving the potential love of your life uh, out there, I guess, with me, uh, you know, while you say this old lady. It, well, I know you're married. It, yeah, that's true. But, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the ideal situation. Um, here, here's what we didn't think about, Gary. We don't have to keep doing the same thing that we're doing all the time. We could change our role. Gary, hand me your keys, and I'll take the old lady in, and you get to hang out with this young lady that could be your, Ooh, your potential, yeah. you know, wife or whatever. I'll get the lady in the safety, and uh, everybody wins. Yeah, but the thing is, <laughs> I drive a stick, and Byron, you can only drive an automatic. Oh, I enjoy driving a stick, unless my arm is hurt or my, my foot's broken. Yeah, well, that I was going to say, case. if you trained in the morning, you know, you could have got heel hooked I or probably arm did get either or more. Yeah, I probably did get healed up early that morning. It's a yeah. good point. But I, did, I thought that was a kind of a fun riddle, and I bombed that it. That was. I like that. You know, break. You know, we're just looking straight into the box. You know, it's uh, sometimes you got to think uh, think a little differently. So, yeah, that was fun. If you want to send Gary a riddle or a, an odd question about life, uh, life adv- seeking life advice, he'd be happy to dish it out at the end of the episode. We usually put our weird stuff anyway. Uh, so that, I think, about wraps up the question for Gary. Um, it was a riddle. So if you want to send Gary something like we said, send, send, send it our way. I'll be happy to hit him with some weird question or riddle. Uh, it's been fun. We'll, guys, we'll catch you guys next week with uh, uh, Sean yeah. McCo. Yep, Sean McCo and, uh, and a quote from uh, AJ. So uh, definitely uh, uh, tune in next week. All right. Thanks, my friends. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.